Hey y'all, it's Brittany and welcome back to another installment of Snapped in Skincare, also known as Clean Skin, Dirty Deeds. This week, we'll be talking all about the case of Mrs. Ruth Ann Aaron. Now, this is the OG Real Housewife of Potomac, and you will understand why when we get into this story, so make sure you stay tuned. Now, first off, as always, I want to give a big thank you and a shout out to everyone who's been riding with me through this whole entire journey. Shout out to all my busy bees out there. Y'all keep engaging, keep commenting. It means the world to me. It's helping me grow, helping us grow. I am super excited for what is to come for us. So thank y'all. And for those of you who are just finding my channel, make sure you subscribe. You definitely do not want to miss anything that I have coming for y'all. I, of course, do snap and skincare, but I also do makeup and true crime. I also do protective styles and wigs. I also do luxury fragrances and all that good stuff. So don't miss out, make sure you subscribe. Also, make sure you hit that notification bell so that you get notified when I post new content. But let's hop right into this story. Ruth Ann Greenswy was born on October 24th of 1942, and she was born in Brooklyn, New York. And she was born to a very blue collar family. Her parents owned like a small local restaurant, a kind of diner, family diner type thing. And that's how they supported their family. Ruth Ann also worked at the family diner to make coins for just whatever she wanted to do, but they were a hardworking family. Now, Ruth Ann was a very smart girl. And after she graduated high school, she ended up going to Cornell University and she earned her microbiology degree from Cornell. But shortly after she went away to college, her parents split and her mother actually moved to be closer to her. And they had a very unusually close relationship. A lot of people said it was kind of like they were best friends, but her mom was really possessive of her at the same time. It was just strange. So she cut ties pretty much with all of her family. She stopped speaking with her dad. At some point she stopped speaking with her younger brother as well. And it was just her and her mom. Now Cornell is also where she met her future husband, Barry Aaron. And at the time, he was a pre-med student when they met, but he was the complete opposite of her, but in a very good way. He was very sweet, very kind. I guess you would wanna say he was more of a beta, and she was definitely more of an alpha, more out there in your face, bold, very passionate, very feelings and emotions on her sleeve kind of person. So they balanced each other out very well. Now, the two of them married in 1965 and they had two children. They had Dana, who was born in 1970, and they had Joshua, who was born in 1972, two years later. Now, Ruth Ann, power to her for this one, but Ruth Ann worked two jobs to put her man through medical school. And that was everything to Barry. He greatly appreciated that. So when he got done with medical school, he put her through law school and she ended up earning a law degree at Catholic University. And by 1984, Barry had a very successful medical practice. So, you know, they were living the good life at that point. They had both been there for each other to support each other's dreams. And now they could live, they, you know, socialite life and that's what they did, they flourished. Now, personally, as an adult, Ruthann was described as very driven. She was very bold and took, you know, the right chances on herself, but she was also a narcissist. She thought extremely highly of herself, so much so that she thought she was better than, you know, most people. And she thought that she was extremely important. And that translated into all of her decisions that she will make from this point out. Now, at this point, since her husband, Barry, has a successful medical practice, 
Ruth Ann has a lot of time on her hands. So in her free time, she decides that she wants to be a property developer. So she starts to buy these development properties and basically flip them for a pretty good profit. And she ends up making a few million on her own. Like, go ahead, sis. And of course, this was taking place during the big real estate boom of the 1980s. So she was really making money. But then she also decided flipping real estate is just, you know, too easy. So she decided that she wanted to be a politician. So in 1992, she got elected to the planning board for her county. Everybody said she did that job very well. She was very meticulous. She knew exactly what she was doing. She had a clear plan all the time. And she thought, well, I'm good at this. So why not try to be a US Senator? I don't know how she made that leap, but that's that narcissism. Like there's steps to this, there's levels to this. And she skipped all the levels. In 1994, she ran for the US Senate. She actually ran against the then national GOP leader. And that was William Brock or Bill Brock. So she was going against the big leagues at that point. This wasn't like a simple neighborhood alderman run. This was the US Senate. And when you run for big races like this, especially in politics, there is no holes barred. Like this is full on war, political war, basically, when you're running in these types of races. So Bill Brock found out that little old Ruth Ann had a couple of lawsuits filed against her in civil court for some developer investors who felt like they were given these fraudulent deals for some of her properties. So when they found that out and they also found out that there were rulings entered against her, meaning she lost those cases in civil court, he ran with that and said, she has been convicted of fraud. A jury has convicted her. Although those things weren't true, it wasn't a criminal court, but he basically put her out there as being a criminal. And when that happened, everything fell apart. She had been doing pretty good in the race against him initially, but when that information broke, everything just tanked. Her ratings tanked, her votes tanked, and she lost the election. Now, she did take Brock to court for slander, and she basically said that he attacked her, basically verbally, and he made some fraudulent claims. However, the jury found that there was nothing abnormal that took place outside of what normally happens in politics. When you get into these type of races, these things happen. It's the nature of politics. Of course, when she lost this case against Bill Brock, she didn't blame herself. She didn't blame you know, what she had done as the cause of her losing the election. She blamed two attorneys that actually testified during the case. And that was Arthur Kahn and another attorney by the last name of Harrison. And basically her claim was that these two lawyers had also testified in her civil suit for the developer deals that went bad. And she felt that they had it out for her. It was a personal attack. So they should not have been allowed to testify in this case when they had been a part of this civil case. Now it took a while for the court to actually rule on the appeal. So the next couple of things that happened with Ruth Ann happened while she's still waiting for the appeal ruling to come back on her case against Bill Brock. Something else that was happening at this time in Ruth Ann's life in 1994, while she was going through this whole process of running for the election and then going to court because of the slander, her father, who she had not had contact with in a very long time, had actually been found dead in the family home. He was found in the cellar and someone had taken a pipe wrench and bashed his head in, unfortunately, and then took masking tape on top of that as if it wasn't bad enough and wrapped his entire head in masking tape, pretty much to make sure that he would suffocate to death. Just the sick people that are in this world, it just, it never ceases to amaze me and not in a good way the people that we have existing in this world. Thankfully, the case of her father being killed was 
solved and they actually convicted two drifters that said they actually attacked him because they were basically trying to rob him for whatever money he had in his pockets and his car. So basically it was a robbery gone wrong. But I wanted to bring this up because it kind of illustrates the relationship that her and her father had and the kind of person that she just was in general. And I really want to read you guys this part. It's from her father's will. So it's very illuminating. Pretty much verbatim what he put in his will was, I specifically and unequivocally leave absolutely nothing for my daughter, Ruth Ann Aaron of Potomac, Maryland, who has been cruel to me and direct my executor to reject any claim that she may make using the proceeds of my estate to take such legal steps as are necessary to disinherit my daughter and carry out my intent. He didn't want her to get a dime, a penny, a piece, a nothing. It was that bad. Now we'll find out later that she has some claims of her own in regards to her father, which very well may be true. And that may also shed some light as to why the family was broken the way it was, but we'll get to that in a bit. But either way, after all of this took place, she still of course felt sad and mourned the death of her father. And I think that may have impacted her ambition just a bit because in 1997, she decided, you know, maybe I should just take a step back and actually just run for city council. And of course her loving husband, Barry, supported that decision 100%. All right, now let's get into the actual crime that took place. On June 2nd, police get a phone call from a man by the name of Billy Mossberg and what he has to say shakes the table in this Potomac community, okay? He says that Ruth Ann contacted him and wanted to meet with him to discuss some things. And when they met, she basically asked him, how can she get in contact with a hitman for hire? Now, obviously this woman is an elite socialite in Potomac. And this man is a landfill owner and operator. He's known around the town, but he's just a blue collar worker. And this woman is a p politician. She's a businesswoman. She's a millionaire. She's a socialite. So who are they gonna believe? So of course police don't believe Mr. Mossberg. So they basically say, prove it. We want you to call Ruth Ann Aaron and we want you to tell her that you found someone. So he does. And they have her on tape talking about it and they agree to link it all up. So what police do is they have one of the detectives go as an undercover officer and he poses as the hitman that is available for hire. Billy gives the phone number to Ruth Ann of this hitman and Ruth Ann calls the hitman promptly. And basically what she tells him is she has some people that she wants to see in the obits. Now, of course, the detective needs more information and he asks, you know, who are we talking about? Who are the target? Who is the target? And she proceeds to tell him Arthur Kahn, who is the attorney that testified in both of the cases that she had going on in court on her behalf. Oh, but she doesn't stop there. She also says, but I have another one. I need you to also get rid of my husband, my loving, supportive husband, Barry Aaron. I mean, if you listen to the tapes, the interviews, all of that stuff, she has no emotion in her voice. Very matter of fact, very to the point, this is a business transaction. Come to find out, this is all because Barry actually wanted a divorce. According to him, the marriage had been falling apart for years. They had been sleeping in separate bedrooms for years and it just wasn't a marriage anymore. And he agreed that, you know, he'd support her 100% throughout her upcoming political race. But after that, he wanted to live his own separate life. They had some type of awakening where one of the friends of theirs, a close friend, had been diagnosed with a fatal illness. And it was just kind of like a wake up call for him that he really needed to live his life for him and enjoy it to the fullest while he was there. So bro wanted a divorce. 
But of course, she had greater ambitions beyond the city council race. So she felt like a divorce would only hurt her career. I don't think she thought past, yeah, but killing your husband or having a hitman hired to kill your husband would probably hurt your career a little more. She didn't think about that. So she ends up meeting with this detective that's undercover as a hitman. And she basically agrees to pay 10K, $10,000 per hit. And one at a time, it will be happening. And she was going to pay $500 as the down payment for the hit. She wanted Khan to be taken out first. And the plan was for her to go to this local hotel and she was supposed to leave a package and the undercover hitman was supposed to come and pick it up and that had the $500 of the down payment in it at this local hotel. So of course they stake it out and police record it and here comes Miss Ruth Ann with her long red wig, a big floppy hat, some big sunglasses and a trench coat. Y'all, it's June. But she was arrested promptly that very same day. And when she was interviewed, she told police, you know, if I would have known that it was going to end up like this and I was being set up, I would have never done it. We know nobody would have done it if they thought they were going to get caught. Now, fast forward to the trial, which took place on February 25th of 1998. Basically, the defense argument was that she was not of sound mind when all of these events were taking place. They had nine different professional experts testify that she had all these different mental diagnoses from being bipolar to having borderline personality disorder. They said she was manic depressive. They said she had some brain injuries. They also said that she had an imbalance in her temporal lobe. Now she did also testify that she was abused as a child by her father. Again, looping back to why maybe that family fell apart. She cut ties with her father. He hated her as much as she hated him. It could all very well be true. But basically the defense used all of this as the reason why she was not of sound mind. Now, prosecution had somebody to testify to disprove every single one of these claims. They had family friends and childhood friends and friends, lifetime friends, testify that there was never any evidence that she was abused. She never mentioned being abused her entire life to anyone. And again, I will never say that she's lying because there's many abused people who never speak up out of fear. So. I will never discredit someone for saying that they were abused because there is not any evidence. That will never be me just stating the facts. But she also argued that her husband forced her to make all these changes to please him. She got her boobs done and just different things that she did to try to make her husband happy. All of these things were supposed to like feed into her mental psyche. But like I said, prosecutors had their own medical specialists and experts testified that it was all a bunch of crap and she didn't have all these diagnoses. It was just the defense's way of trying to explain away some very hard evidence that they had. Prosecutors had 12 tapes of her being recorded talking about this whole ordeal, this whole request for Hitman and who she wanted hit and setting it up and talking the terms through and meeting up. It was all on tape, all of it. They also found that whole disguise, the wig, the trench coat, the hat, the sunglasses in her truck. She also had a book on how to be a hitman, uh, something of that nature. She had a book on how to create silencers and she also bought the pieces needed to create the silencers. She was, she was ready for that life. She was all about it. And police also, as they were going through her home and her closet, they found a vial of crushed up lethal, like a lethal mix of crushed up medication that would have killed someone if given to them. So they felt like she was probably about ready to poison her husband. Now, unfortunately, the jury ended up coming back a hung jury at the end of this case. 
And it was one juror that was the holdout. And a lot of the people involved in this case felt like it was because of the juror's background. Come to find out, her career was working with disturbed children, emotionally disturbed children. So a lot of people felt like because she came from that background, she had connected with the story that Ruth Ann told about her father abusing her and she just couldn't find it in her heart to convict this woman. So with that being said, the prosecutors felt like no way. With the right set of jurors, we will convict this woman easily. So they were ready for a retrial. But before they could get the retrial going, Ruth Ann decided that she wanted to plead no contest. And she was sentenced to two 18 month sentences for each murder for hire. And they were to be served consecutively. That's it. That's all she got for trying to hire someone to get rid of two people, two people that had two families. Now, Ruth Ann has since been released and she is now living as Ruth Ann Green. And she looks like she splits her time between Maryland and Palm Beach, Florida. Nice life to have. She's also written an autobiography about her life and pretty much proclaiming her innocence, even though there is so much physical evidence that proves that she did what she did. Barry has, thank God, remarried and moved on with his life. And their daughter, Dana, became a psychologist and she actually works at Northwestern University here in Chicago. And their son, Joshua, became a stockbroker. And unfortunately, he lost his life in the attacks on 9-11 of the World Trade Center. That is the story of Ruth Ann Aaron, a woman who was, like I said, the real OG housewife of Potomac. She was about her money. She dabbled in everything. She did not play. She wanted what she wanted. Sounds very familiar. And it's just unfortunate how greed can take over people. Narcissism, greed, all of that fed into this story. And it's so unfortunate how we almost lost two people for no reason. No reason whatsoever. Today's mask was one of my favorites. It was the Saturday Skin Yuzu vitamin C sleep mask. And I really love this mask. I wanna show you guys the texture of it so that you can see what I was talking about in the last video. It has like, like these orange little chunks and pieces in it. And it actually, those pieces dissolve into your skin. But I was researching about this and there, the fruit, the yuzu fruit that's in it, they use Every piece of it, they use the seed, they use the fruit, they use the peel, they use all of that. And this is super moisturizing. You can use it as a moisturizer. You can use it as a mask that you wash off the way that I do, or you can use it as an overnight sleep mask. And sometimes I use it as that as well, but it is great for brightening. It is great for moisturizing. It tech all that texture it does a great job with all of those things the other thing that i wanted to call out really quick was this product that i've used before as well and that's the murad city skin overnight detox moisturizer and y'all i this is my second time using this in a video and i just recently started using this just in general the first time i used this the detox was real. I woke up the next day with whiteheads, multiple whiteheads. It was getting everything out of my skin overnight. So I'm gonna continue to use this to see how well it works, if it was just a fluke. It has not been so far. It's gotten everything out that needs to be out, okay? So I really like this. Let me know if you guys have used either of these products before. One other thing that I don't really talk about a lot is the last thing that I always put on at night, which is my Laneige, the lip sleeping mask. And this is gummy bear. This is like my favorite scent. It's so fruity. It smells yummy, but it is really good at moisturizing your lips and it you wake up and it's still there. So I love this. Keep them dry lips at bay, okay? But yeah, I just wanted to share some little pieces of the skincare routine that I don't talk about as often. I'll try to share more information more often on the skincare products too, at least one to two every video. 
and try to share different little nuggets of information each time. Maybe it'll be on the actual ingredients that's in it and that's why I use it or the actual product itself, that kind of thing. So I'll try to keep the information flowing for y'all on this skincare as well at the end of these videos. But yeah, it's been fun, y'all. I will catch y'all next time, meaning next week. So make sure you subscribe if you have not. Make sure you hit that notification bell so you know as soon as this video comes out. But otherwise, I will see y'all next time. Love you guys. Bye.